Hiking across the Canadian forest, the group of high school boys were on the verge of a mental breakdown. They had just spotted a DEA van stalking them in the woods because inside these kids' backpacks was over 400 pounds of weed. You see, these weren't your average high schoolers. These kids had a smuggling empire that had brought in 17,000 pounds of weed and their parents would kill them if they ever found out. Undetected, the boys dropped to the floor to find a way around it. But Nate Norman, the leader of the group, shushed the others and flicked his night vision goggles to get a closer look and began smirking at what he saw. These DEA agents they were so afraid of that could end everything that night were asleep in their van this entire time. And as the boys snuck by and made it home safely that night, Nate Norman, the leader of the group, had just made the easiest money he'd ever made in his life, half a million dollars. In 2001, two rival groups of high school nerds became the biggest drug smugglers in the United States. Invading the DEA, FBI, and Border Patrol for years, they had smuggled in 17,000 pounds of wheat, making $32 million. But through jealousy, betrayals, and shady deals, their empires would fall apart before any of them could legally drink. This is the true story of the nerdy teens who became drug kingpins. Now, Nate Norman wasn't exactly a criminal mastermind. As a broke 19-year-old high school dropout working at Pizza Hut living in his mom's basement in Idaho, the closest he'd ever gotten to organized crime was watching Scarface on cable. Because with no degree and a dead-end job, the American dream felt so far away for Nate Norman. Change one day when Nate and his buddy Topher were smoking a J, flipping through Times Magazine and stumbled across a story that would change their lives forever. Canada had the best weed in the world, BC Buds, and smuggling BC Buds across the border? Oh, it's a $7 billion business. Wait a sec, Nate thought. Idaho's right next to the Canadian border. Now, while people knew Nate delivered pizzas around town, he also delivered sacks. Although Nate's prices were high and his bud quality sucked. But knowing that the best buds in the entire world were just a few hours away, oh, Nate could sell the hell out of it if he could just get his hands on it. So that's when he turned the Topher and said, we should become international drug smugglers. Now, while this idea of a criminal enterprise sounds great to a 19-year-old, a pound of weed costs money, and they were both broke. Pizza Hut didn't pay great, and Topher worked part-time at Castle Park. But Topher, believing in his best friend Nate, sold an old boat he had dragged out of the lake for 1,400 bucks, and assuming that was enough to buy a pound of weed, the two head on the Canada with what was their life savings. But after coasting through the checkpoint, they quickly realized Canada was not what they thought it was. See, high times made it seem like people sold pounds of weed on the side of the road, but it really just looked like the US, except kilometers. What the fuck? So empty handed, after hours of searching for a vendor, the two head into a Canadian bar to at least make the trip worthwhile. Maybe Nate's plan was too ambitious, he thought. It, it almost seemed too easy. But old man Frankie, a regular at the bar, gestured at the two Americans sticking out like sore thumbs. As Nate and Topher walked over to him, they said, could you help us procure a pound of flowers? One pound? Frankie said he had dozens of Canada's finest, but it was all back at his apartment. And while Nate and Topher tried to contain their excitement, thinking this was their big connect for BC Buds, well, Old man Frankie had just found his next victim. But inside his crappy apartment, the two realized Frankie actually seemed a bit sketch. But I mean, the, where else were they gonna go? They were desperate. How much cash you got, Frankie said. For 1,400, is, is that enough for a pound? That's perfect, that's exactly what a pound costs, Frankie said. But as Nate opened up the bag to get a whiff of those BC buds he had traveled all this way for, Frankie tells him that wouldn't be wise. I mean, they didn't want to get caught from the smell. So with that even Wayne smelling or barely even looking at it, the two hand over what was their life savings to a sketchy grandpa they just met at a seedy Canadian bar. And with the pound of BC buds in hand, they begin the hardest part now, trying to get home. Now, according to High Times, the Canadian border is five times longer than the Mexican one, but there's no offense. I mean, you walk in the woods, next thing you know, you cross international lines. And while thousands of smugglers hid weed in horse trailers, snowmobiles, sailboats, hollowed out logs, hell, even underground tunnels, hiking weed across the border was just the easiest, but also the riskiest. So the plan? Nate was gonna drive back home by himself while Topher would smuggle their precious cargo, hiking seven mile, 11 kilometers across the Canadian wilderness filled with bears by himself. Hours later, with dirt on his face, Topher saw his first sign of American civilization. Outback Steakhouse, where there's no rules, it's just right. With Nate parked outside, Topher hopped in for a celebratory smoke of their freshly smuggled BC buds. It seemed like the plan had worked, it had all gone well. But after the first hit, something was off. This wasn't the creme de la creme BC buds. No, Frankie had sold them Mexican brickweed at BC bud prices. Or in other words, this should have been $400 a pound. Not 1400 Frankie had sold them buds that were grown in Mexico, smuggled into the US, smuggled into Canada, and then smuggled back down to the United States. And that's when they learned you can't trust anyone in the game, including the ancients, the elderly, 
and the week. But luckily enough, the weed drought in Idaho was so bad they could actually still make money on this. Nate hit up his old friend Scuzz to have him sell it on the streets, and Scuzz was a connected dude even at 18 years old. Selling it to every hood rat in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Days later, Scuzz came back with 2,800 bucks, double what they had bought it for. And with his business model proven to work, Nate turned the tofer and said, High Times was right. Why doesn't everyone do this? Because according to their calculations, Nate and Topher were shocked to find out they could make $3 million in just 14 months by doubling their money with every smuggling run. And to them, that seemed like enough. Because with 3 million bucks in hand, the two could buy homes, start a business, and leave the game while they were ahead. Because when drug dealers get caught, it's always because they get too greedy and give themselves away, but that wasn't gonna be them. They promised to themselves, no guns, no girls, nothing flashy. But little do they know that once you're in the game, there's no easy exits. Because while the rewards are great, the risks are even greater. With one pound became two, became four, became eight, and Nate was growing more comfortable driving thousands of dollars through the Canadian checkpoint, you know, flashing a little disarming wave and a little lip smile. But today, as he coasted through the Canadian checkpoint driving the crest in Canada, Nate really thought about it. This was the ticket out for him. He didn't need college. Hell, with a few more smuggle runs, he could buy his mom a car. And if he found a good grower, oh, Nate could make the big bucks. But then in his rearview mirror, he spotted those Canadian red and blue lights. Sirens grew louder. Nate Norman was getting pulled over by the cops. With American license plates, he knew he stuck out like a sore thumb. As the mount, he parked his car and stepped out. Every step he took, Nate could only think about how more he was. But as he rolled down his window, the mount, he said, so hey, you guys smuggling? Well, because you're not gonna get any flour going the Creston. It's a bunch of loggers. You need to go to Nelson. Don't speed, this is a little warning. Yeah. Getting let off the hook and even a tip on where to find the holy grail of BC buds, Nate was totally wrong. Canada was way different than the United States. Now, bigger than tourism logging, hell, even maple syrup. In 2001, BC Buds was a $7 billion a year business in Canada, and Nelson was the capital of it. But why? Well, Canada had some of the most relaxed bud laws in the world at the time. We generally feel there's a slightly more humanitarian government around here that's not into putting people away for the rest of their life for their choice of herbs. And hydroponic stores that sold Tomato growing equipment sprawled all around the city. And the result was the golden age of BC buds that were sought all around the world. And for Nate, this is what High Times was talking about. So walking into several Canadian hydroponic stores, Nate finally found the real BC bud growers that could get him the product to bring down serious weight to the United States. And for Nate, the money would begin pouring in while millions of Americans were just baked out of their minds with, with cotton mouth. But not anymore with today's sponsor, Arab. Arab ain't any other water bottle. It's a completely new way of drinking. It adds flavor to the water through the power of scent. And this thing is fire. Now, when I first tried this, this thing tripped me out because it tastes like it's flavored water, but you don't actually put anything in the water. So how does it work? Using the flavored scent pods that come in 15 flavors, you fill up the Arab bottle with any type of water, pull up the pod to activate. And now I got raspberry lemon water on the go that tastes great with zero calories. And best of all, there is no tablets, there's no powder, to put in, meaning I don't have to clean this thing with the bristle trying to get all inside. No, nope, it's just good to go all the time. No joke, ever since I got this, I've already dusted an entire pack of these in about a week. Yeah, I would say I like this a lot actually. So get yourself an Arab bottle, get yourself some flavored pods and see which one's your favorite because I'm loving the raspberry lemon. On a typical run, Nate and Topher waited until dark and drove within a mile of the border on a remote access road, where Topher, dressed in all camo, would leap out and disappear into the trees. But instead of Nate driving the money over the border, Topher was carrying a hockey bag stuffed with cash for over seven miles, would exchange with the growers directly in Canada, head back down to America. While back in the States, he would hand the bag off to Nate, who would hand it off to Scuzz, who would hand it off to hundreds of dealers. And for all of this, Topher made $1,000 with each run, while Nate by this point had pocketed over a hundred and 50 grand, more money than he'd ever seen in his lifetime. You see, BC buds were in demand and Nate's operation needed to expand. With serious money coming in, the boys got serious about their methods. Topher hired friends from high school to help him run since these halls were too heavy for just one dude. By now, it was six Toyota 4Runners filled with runners that would head towards the border drop point where they would all change in the camo, slip out into the trees carrying hockey bags full of cash up to 400 grand. 
Now, 12 months earlier, they all said they wouldn't be flashy with their money. Slowly, they all began to get the things they had always wanted. Four wheelers, jet skis, plasma screen TVs, mini disc players, whatever they got, it was the most expensive version of it. Scuzz moved out of his mom's basement and told her he was renting a little crappy apartment, but in reality, he bought a lakeside home. Nate began throwing elaborate lingerie parties, inviting half of the town nearly every other week. And while as the boss, Nate should have been keeping tabs on who was too loud, well, Nate was actually the worst offender. Nate bought himself a eight bedroom mansion, several stash houses, an Escalade with 24 inch rims, diamond chains, Dom Perignon, gats and straps, and eight balls of nose candy. And like most drug dealers, became convinced he would become a rapper, so he bought studio time with his drug money. But not all was wild. Nate had found a lovely girlfriend that he had met at a church event. Just kidding, she was a stripper and her name was Buffy. And Nate showered her with all of the jewelry, Gucci bags, trips to Cabo. And as foolish as it was to draw all of this attention to himself, Nate had just never been cool in his life. He just couldn't resist it. While his high school friends used to call him the Keebler elf growing up, those same friends were now working for Nate. But when Nate's mom asked him where he was getting all of this cash from, well, he told her it was his snowplow business and then bought her a lakeside home. And she never asked again. You see, Nate had been a paper boy, a telemarketer, cashier, pizza man, but he learned that the only get rich quick scheme that actually works in this world is selling drugs and Nate was damn good at it. A year later, the crew had swelled to 32 people and they're moving thousands of pounds all over the country. Nate's janky operation, nah, it transformed into a well-oiled machine, but even then, they still had problems. One night, the runners walked into DEA agents sleeping in their truck in the forest. On a 14 below winter night, they'd lost sight of the trail and nearly froze to death in the dark. Now, the drive home was arguably the riskiest part of the entire run. So Nate began rigging all the forerunners with explosives. So if they ever got pulled over by the American cops, they could just set the weed on fire. You see, the stakes were high because getting caught now meant a couple years in prison. I mean, this is 2002 after all. But to calm the runner's anxiety over moving thousands of pounds of buds across the country committing federal felonies, Nate Pinky promised them that if they ever were arrested, just give them a call from the jail, he would pay for their bail and their attorneys and it would all be good. But Topher grew nervous with this flashy lifestyle and growing operation. He begged Nate to get out of the game, but Nate joked he would never stop until the cops got him because in his mind, he could just pay for the best attorneys to get him out. So why not go hard? Because that $3 million goal, nah, that's what Nate now made in a month. So to shut Topher up, he raised his pay to $8,000 a run, locking his best friend, the guy that had helped him start this entire thing in golden handcuffs. But Topher's fears almost came true when a fight broke out over a girl at a 150 person party the crew was hosting. One of Nate's dealers shot a gun in the air to break up the fight, but nobody even heard it. So Nate plastered as hell, shot off a 45 Magnum into the house. The crowd began screaming, everyone scattered, the neighbors called the cops, cars sped off and crashed into the fences. And Scuzz got pulled over on his way home with 20 grand in his pocket, nearly peeing in his pants. The cops, they let him go. And then the next night, they threw another party at the same house, equally as crazy. See, they felt invincible. They were rich. They were cool. And by now, the cops either didn't know about their operation or just didn't even care. In Nate's eyes, nobody had gotten hurt. Nobody had gotten caught. Maybe this could just go on forever. At 3 a.m., Nate gets a frantic call. Scuzz was robbed by three masked men. They broke inside of his home, held him at gunpoint, and wanted to know where was the cash and the buds, or else one of the burglars, Giovanni, was gonna chop his finger off. Now, for Scuzz, handing them 40 grand in cash and a couple pounds in buds wasn't the end of the world, but Nate had seriously ruffled someone's feathers because they knew not just what they were up to, but also where they lived. Now, Nate Norman wasn't the only teenager in Idaho who had an enterprise of smuggling in BC buds. Nicknamed Wang, he was born in Korea and adopted by insurance executives in Idaho. And Wang had grown up with a perfect life. He played the violin, honorable student, but at 17 years old, the kid broke bad. See, Wang began running his own wildly successful bud smuggling operation, transforming from the Kumon kid into a wankster driving an Eldorado lowrider, popping oxys and snorting yay all day long. In many ways, Wang was a lot like Nate, a nerdy teen who just grew into a drug kingpin, but he was also Nate's polar opposite. You see, Wang wasn't satisfied in pulling in millions with his friends, hell no. He wanted the whole market. Now, Nate knew of Wang and other dealers in town, but figured there was so much money in the game that everyone could eat good. But no, Wang's thriving business had been falling apart since Nate's arrival, and Wang was growing desperate to gain back his market share. Sniffling his nose after racking a couple lines, Wang called up his old roommate Giovanni for a little job proposal, a hit job, to take out Nate Norman. Promising to pay $100,000 for the job with a $5,000 down payment up front that he would get him later, Giovanni, a dude who had never committed a crime in his life, 
said why not. So Giovanni called his friends and headed to the Kmart to buy supplies for the hit job. A tarp, gloves, windbreakers. Wang gave him a couple handguns and for good measure, a knife as well. Since Giovanni thought, well, you can't have fingerprints if you don't have fingers. Now Wang figured it'd be a really simple job. To exonerate himself on the night of the hit, he threw himself an alibi party to be seen by as many people as not murdering Nate. But instead of Giovanni doing the hit that night, they broke in the Skaz's apartment stealing the pounds of bud and 40K in cash because Giovanni still hadn't received that $5,000 down payment yet. So we thought, why not make some extra money robbing Nate's crew first and then murdering Nate? Makes sense. Now, when Nate heard about Scuzz's robbery, he figured it was the cartel or maybe some other gangbangers in town, but he didn't even realize he was in a turf war with the only other nerdy kingpin in town, Wang. And for the first time, Nate was truly spooked. He moved out of his house. He rented another one across town. He started sleeping with the loaded handgun under his pillow. And Nate would try to lay low the rest of that summer, moving in with Buffy. But after breaking both of his arms, flipping over his dirt bike, Nate developed a serious addiction to painkillers. And even worse, Buffy couldn't even take care of him because she'd gotten a boob job. Nate was living in fear, addicted to painkillers, and worst of all, his girlfriend had really big boobs. On November 13, 2002, a lumberjack discovers a murdered boy in the forest. Now, police identify the boy as Brendan Butler. Brendan's parents were in shock. They told the cops he had played the violin. He was an honorable student, a traditional good boy. I mean, who the hell would end his life? But digging further, the cops discover Brendan Butler lived a double life. Under the nickname of Wang, he was a big time dealer distributing buds all over the United States. And that his number one business rival was Nate Norman. Now, when the headlines broke of Wang's death, Nate told his crew, who was questioning him about it, that he had no involvement in it. But I mean, who really knew at this point? Nate had transformed from a pizza delivery driver living in his mom's basement to a kingpin with a smuggling empire that even the cartel was jealous of. It just didn't seem out of the question that Nate could be involved, but Nate was having bigger problems to fry. Now that month, some of Nate's dealers got picked up by the cops who found cash, drugs, and guns on him. Now from jail, the dealers took their customary one phone call, and that's when the cops heard them saying, tell Nate, I'm in jail. The DEA, the FBI, and Homeland Security now knew that Nate Norman was the guy behind this entire operation. But what happened to Wang, or Brendan Butler? Now you see, Wang had no idea his own hitmen were pissed off at him. He was so coked out and on drugs, he literally forgot he owed them money. So with holding that $5,000 for months, Wang took Giovanni and his crew to the forest where he wanted Nate's body to be buried when the murder was done. Now there, Giovanni asked him again for the down payment. Wang said, don't worry about it, bro. Giovanni got pissed. Wang told him to chill out. Giovanni grabbed Wang by the neck, squeezing harder and harder. Wang, hardly able to talk, begged for his life but Giovanni did not know how to stop what he had started. Choking Wang to death, Gio slashed his throat to hide the fingerprints, took the cash on him, and left Wang's body on the exact spot that Nate's body was supposed to be buried. But now with the body being found and the murder and the fingers and the money, Nate knew it was probably time to step out of the game. Now with the heat on Nate's crew thinking that he could be responsible for Wang's murder, all of the runners would meet at a stash house at dawn to pack up all of their things and skip out of town. But instead when they got there, they kicked around smoking weed, reminiscing on the good times. And then right then and there across four states serving six warrants, the FBI arrested runners, managers, dealers, everyone except for Nate Norman. You see, while the cops had been tracking Nate Norman ever since Wang's murder, somehow he had outwitted the FBI, the DEA, Homeland Security for months, the same way he had avoided Giovanni. But without Nate there to pay off his crew's bail and all of their attorney fees, one by one, they all began to rat out Nate Norman and reveal the entire operation. But once Nate heard the feds had turned the crew on one another and told them all they were all gonna go to jail for a very long time unless they got everyone, Nate Norman walked into the police station and the cops could not believe their eyes. They were expecting a hardened criminal mastermind, but they got a kid that used to deliver pizzas. Now, while the feds estimated 2,500 pounds were smuggled in, in reality, they had moved over 17,000 pounds of weed over the border, netting them $32 million. Barely out of their teens, these kids had embarrassed the United States government and somebody was gonna take the fall. Giovanni was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Brendan Butler. Scuzz and Topher were given two years in the slammer and Nate Norman would get 12 years. And a sick twist of fate had it not went down the way it did, Nate probably wouldn't be alive. Today, Nate Norman's out of prison. He actively runs an AC business and it seems like life for him is doing good.